What's the best chain order for mixing your music? Let's talk about it. What's up guys, this is Steven Malin, music composer for The Screen, helping you build a music business that supports your family. Today, we're talking about mixing basics, specifically how to set a chain order so that your plugins can give you the best mixing results possible. For new composers, mixing can feel extremely overwhelming. I know because I've been there. I remember when I first started writing music, I thought that by just simply throwing on an EQ or a reverb or compressor, that it just instantly made my music sound better. But the truth is, I probably did more harm than good. And a lot of new composers fall into that same trap where they might get a ton of advice from great mixers, because let's face it, there is a sea of information out there if you want to learn on YouTube how to do just about anything with mixing, you're going to find someone's opinion. But at the end of the day, if you don't understand the foundation of mixing and why we mix, or most importantly, how the chain order works, then you're really not going to get anywhere with your mixing. So the goal of this video is by the end, I want you to have a template that you can start with every single time that you mix your music. Before we dive in, I have to give the disclaimer that as much as I wish that there is one mixing template that solved every problem, it's just not the truth. There will be times that you want to shuffle these around. There will be times that you want to maybe remove one of these items or add an extra one for experimentation. But here is a tried and true method that is going to help you navigate these really rough waters of how to mix your music. So you ready? Let's jump in. All right, so here we are inside a Cubase session. This is a recent film score that I worked on. And you'll notice inside here, there's a ton of MIDI regions that I use to compose this with, a ton of different instruments. Track sounds a little something like this. All right, so you'll notice right off the bat that without mixing plugins on here, it sounds very much out of control. It sounds like it's just a, a very muddy mix. There's not a lot of clarity. It's really hard to tell what's supposed to be the most important element. And if we take a look at the mixer itself for the session, you'll notice that I have a lot of different volume levels. So mixing is not just sliding up and down volume faders because if you do that you can still have a very muddy mix so there are some strategies we can use here with the chain order if we go in order from top to bottom it's really going to help us out to make our music sound way cleaner and just more polished and more professional so the chain order that i'm referring to is to start with an eq and then second is a compressor. Third is a reverb or a delay. And fourth is a limiter. Now you'll notice that these are all currently on my stereo out channel. It doesn't mean that you need to put these on your stereo out channel, but perhaps you, if you don't have any mixing plugins on your entire track, this might be the best place to start, just to start learning. But you will notice that my track here has a ton of different tracks, has a ton of different instruments and different effects going on. So you'll notice that every single track has an EQ on it up top, with the exception of the strings. And in some cases, I just had the reverb plugin right there. But you'll notice how there really isn't much similarity between all of them because every instrument is different and has different needs. But if we follow this chain order of going EQ, compression, reverb or delay, and limiting, we're going to most of the time have a very solid order. Now you'll notice here on the stereo out track that I also have this Voxingo recorder plugin. This is just so that you can hear the audio coming from my DAW. This really has nothing, no impact on what we're doing here today. So let's actually start from the bottom of the chain and work our way up so we can better understand what is actually happening. So at the bottom of my chain on the stereo out, I always start with a limiter. 
So my favorite limiter is the Waves L1 limiter, the stereo version. Be careful not to use mono plugins or else your music will be very, very skinny and flat in the middle. What I do is I always go to my out ceiling and I type in negative 0.1. Some people prefer negative 0.3, but the whole purpose here is that we have a nice clean out ceiling. That way, when our music plays, if I just solo that real quick, you'll notice that the bars here indicating volume, they will never go past the brick wall limiter of negative 0.1. The reason we choose that is because zero is unity. Zero is the volume we never want to go higher than. So by having negative 0.1, it just means that my volume, even at the loudest peak of the track, will never hit that ceiling. Now, if you were to squish this down much, much lower, it is going to make the mix lower in volume, but it's also gonna compress it because ultimately a limiter is just a 10 times multiplied compressor. It's a 10 to one ratio. It's an extreme compressor, but I recommend to always have a limiter at the bottom of your chain. This will prevent any audio from ever escaping. It will never uh, allow any peaks to cut through and it's going to create a very clean mix. Above that is my reverb. Now I've done a reverb shootout video here on YouTube where I compared 2C Aether, 2C B2, and Waves IR1, which are my top three recommendations for reverbs. There's a card up here. You can check out that video if you'd like. For this purpose today, since we're doing more orchestral music, I chose to use 2C Aether. Now, reverb is something that you should always be very, very cautious of using. You don't want to drown your music in reverb. Reverb is space. It is allowing your music to emulate a different space. If you do want to check out my reverb comparison video, I talk about the difference between algorithmic and convolution reverb. I don't want to get into the science of it here today, but the idea is that convolution reverb is much more realistic and algorithmic reverb is much more electronic and experimental. Um, so for today, I like to use the Hall reverb with 2C Aether, and the mix is really what's gonna make the biggest impact here today. So if we're just throwing a reverb on the master chain and the stereo out, then you wanna make sure this mix is really low, something like 15 or 20%, even with 20%. Let's hear how that affects the sound. We can test this by pushing the spacebar in our DIW to play the track. And then of course, to push it again, is going to uh, let us hear the reverberation of the room that we're trying to put the orchestra into. So one more time. You can also visually see all of the volume bars here as they decrease back down to negative infinity. You can watch how long your reverb tail is. And that is referring to this time knob, which is 3.5 seconds of decay. So you can certainly do your reverb this way, but the way that I would suggest you do it instead is to get rid of your reverb right there. Instead, create a new track. So every DAW does this quite differently, but in Cubase, you create an effect track. You make sure it's a stereo and you might want to call it reverb in other DAWs, it might be called an aux or an auxiliary track. So you create that effects track, and there it is right there in purple. And then what I can do is go to my routing, and I can hit the Q-Link button to group my tracks together that I select. And what I can do is go over here and just select all of the instruments that I want to send to that reverb. And then since everything's uh, connected with the Q-Link, I can go to Instead of stereo out for my output, I can choose reverb. And now what it's doing is it's sending all of those tracks, all of those instruments to the reverb track here and whatever amount I send it to. So right now the mix, let's see if we put it back down to 20%. Now all of my instruments will be at that 20% amount.
So another way that you can do this is instead of sending everything equally to one percentage here, we can remove all of those by just going to stereo out. And instead, I can individually go to every single instrument and in the sins section, I can go to the reverb and then I can choose an amount to send to the reverb. A zero would be considered 100%. So if I were to go to this piano track here and solo it, and let's go to the send and let's put that on the reverb. Let's turn it on at 100% of the reverb. If I wanna pump it back up to 100% mix, that way we're not getting any weird math here. So 100% sounds like this. That's quite a bit of reverb. So what I can do is I can decrease it here and I can even play around with this little button here called pre or post fader so what that means is the volume itself will indicate whether or not the aux or in this case the send to the reverb is being activated so if I want to maybe go somewhere in the middle of this send. You'll notice that as I go up and down with the volume, it also increases or decreases the amount of send, in this case, reverb. Next in our chain is compression. Now I have two favorite compressors. First one is FabFilter Pro C. I like this one because it's very easy to visually see what's happening. The other plugin that I would recommend is Waves API 2500 if you can afford it, but I understand that this is not a very budget friendly compressor. And you also notice that it's much harder to use because there's not much of a visual indicator of what happens when you twist the knobs. So. For simplicity today, let's just use the Pro C by FabFilter. I think that'll give us an easier idea of what's actually happening. So a compressor is all about loudness. It's all about the perceived loudness of a track. It helps us to better see this because we're using a threshold, a ratio, and then if we need to play around with how the sound is going to be affected, that's where the attack and release knobs come in. So at default, I would always recommend putting your threshold at zero and your ratio at one to one, which is in other words, 0% compression. So if I start playing the track at a low volume, the waveform here is just kind of dancing along, showing me where the volume is or the loudness is. So a good way to test this is if I were to take the input and crank it up to an unreasonably loud level. 36 dB over unity, so plus 36. Now that's gonna break our ears unless we have a compressor on. So I'm gonna turn the threshold up a ton, I'm gonna turn the ratio up a ton, and you'll notice what happens to the waveform. It's getting totally squished underneath this graph here. So if I play, you can feel, oof, even feel it with the reverb tail there. You can feel how far away, and you can see how far away the new waveform is from the red line. So the goal of compression is to keep the waveform as close to that red line as possible without being squished. So if I were to obviously bring that back down and then bring the threshold and ratio back to a more reasonable level, usable and we can actually use that piano in our track. Now, in this particular track, we really don't need compression because there's no loud moments. There's no huge over the top loud moments that we need to crush down and control. So compression is not a must have. In fact, I would even advise you to avoid compression as much as possible because compression typically destroys mixes faster than it helps them. Compression is something that should be used very subtly and only as you need it. So for this track, I'm not even going to use it at all. The final plugin I want to talk about is an equalizer. I always put an EQ at the top of my chain order because it has the largest amount of impact on the quality of your sound. 
if you accidentally put an EQ at the bottom of your chain, it's not going to do very much because ultimately the EQ is the tone or the timbre of your instrument. If you mess around with this order too much, it's just not going to give a quality sound. So an EQ is really for the purpose of carving out frequencies you don't like. It's not really made to boost things that you do like. It's all about attenuating or taking away particular frequencies you don't like. So for example, the two most EQ curves that I use are high cuts and low cuts. So let's create a curve here at the bottom and let's drag it up while we play to see what's gonna happen. See how the sound gets squished? So the only thing we're hearing is what's underneath the green. That's why I love these FabFilter plugins. So typically what I do is I always roll off anything less than 20. Because typically in that sub bass area, it's not good frequencies. They're, they're sounds that are only going to hurt your mix, not help. Likewise, I like to roll off anything above 20K, typically. Not in every situation, but in most cases, something around there. And you can hear what happens if I start going too low. because these super high frequencies and super low frequencies do not help your mix. They take up head room, which is your mixing space. It takes it up without giving you anything good in return. And a quick side note, if you're ever going to turn on your analyzers for EQs, only use them for the actual mixing process. Once you're done, hit off. This way you're not stealing all of your CPU and RAM that you need to be using for the rest of your music and loading sample libraries and such. So EQ is one of those things that I like to add on every instrument because it helps me to shape exactly what I want that particular instrument to look like. So there's my wind ensemble. Let's compare that to a string ensemble. And you'll see like in this instance, I did decide to boost a little bit, but nothing crazy. And essentially I'm using an EQ on every single track. And probably the most prominent one is this sub hit. So I were to just solo that. Let's listen to this sub hit without any EQ at all. And you're gonna hear a huge difference. And then here it is with the EQ on it. Completely different, right? So EQ completely changed the timbre or the tone of that particular sound. So if I had put maybe reverb or compression or any other effect above that, then it really wouldn't have the same effect as putting the EQ first, because you want to make sure that you are shaping the rest of your effects and your chain order around the new tone. You really don't want to get those backwards. And so if I were to take this chain order here and apply it to the entire track as needed on each individual track, let's play a portion of the track with and without the plugins on. So here's a portion of the track with no plugins. And then let's compare that to if I go through and turn them all back on. So there you go. Now you have a template for yourself for a proper chain order for your mixing plugins. I hope that this equips you to get out there and to start mixing great music. Thanks for watching guys. If this video was helpful for you, hit that like button and subscribe to the channel for more videos like this every Wednesday. If you're ready to add some of these mixing plugins to your studio today, go to the links in the description below. Full disclaimer, Many of these links are affiliate links that support my channel at no additional cost to you. So thank you so much for your support. And I hope that these really do help you improve your mixes. I wanna give a special shout out to my Patreon patrons right here on the screen. 
Thank you guys so much for your financial support of my YouTube channel here. You really make this possible for me to be consistent on the channel. If you'd like direct feedback on your music tracks, or you just want to have one-on-one -on -one conversations about your top music business questions with me, come join our Patreon community at stephenmalin.com slash Patreon. Link in the description below. I'll see you guys next week. Until then, check out this music production tips playlist where I've already tackled a ton of your mixing questions right over this way. So check that out and I'll see you guys then.